Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Karen Valerius, the chair of the English department. Uh, and I, we're, we're going to get started. Um, thank you for joining us today uh, for celebrating our own, a reading series created by my colleague Martha McPhee in collaboration with the Cultural Center to feature the published writings of Hofstra's talented faculty and alumni for our campus and local communities. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank a few people. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dean Eva Badaska from Hofstra College for her support. Uh, also, uh, Athleen Collins and the Cultural Center staff, Carol Mallison, Amy Trotta, and Janine Rinaldi, whose efforts make today's event possible. Uh, also, students, um, stick around at the end of the event today for our raffle. Um, as you came in, I think you were given a, a raffle ticket. So. Um, the three lucky winners of our drawing will go home with a copy of one of the books featured at today's readings. And then finally, you are all invited to reception in honor of our featured writers at the Hofstra, Hofstra Hall Parlor directly following this event. So I am very proud today to introduce my accomplished colleagues, um, each of whom has recently published a memoir. So first, Kelly McMasters is Director of Publishing Studies and Associate Professor of, in the English Department where she teaches creative nonfiction. She is an essayist, mother, and former bookshop owner, and she is the author of The Leaving Season, a memoir and essays, which you'll hear more about today, and Welcome to Shirley, a memoir from an atomic town, which is the basis for the documentary film The Atomic States of America. She is also co-editor with Margot Kahn of two essay collections, Wanting, Women Writing About Desire, and This is the Place, Women Writing About Home. Crystal Brent Zook is professor of journalism, media studies, and public relations. She is an award-winning journalist and author of four books, including Color by Fox, The Fox Network, and The Revolution in Black Television. The Girl in the Yellow Poncho is Zook's coming of age tale about what it means to be biracial in America. Her story is one of strong black women, herself, her cousin, her mother, and her grandmother, and the generational cycles of oppression and survival that seemingly define their lives. And you'll be hearing more about that book as well. And then finally, Martha McPhee is writer in residence and professor in the English department where she teaches fiction. She is the author of the novels An Elegant Woman, Dear Money, Lamerica, Gorgeous Lies, and Bright Angel Time. She is also the author of Omega Farm, a memoir, which you'll be hearing more about today. Uh, her work has been honored with fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts and the John Simon Guggenheim, Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and nominated for a National Book Award. So please join me in welcoming our three distinguished colleagues. And just a, a note about format, uh, each of them is going to come to the podium to read from their memoir for, for a few minutes. Um, then they'll take the stage and they have uh, questions for one another. We'll have a discussion of memoir writing and craft. Um, and then we'll open it up, open up the discussion to all of you to, to ask questions. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Karen, so much for that warm welcome. And thank you to everybody Karen thanked. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. I'm really honored to be here today with these two incredible writers. Um, I uh, wouldn't be here at all if it were not for Martha McPhee, uh, who was on the hiring committee uh, when I came here. Um, but more than that, she's such an influential writer for any writer working today, whether it's in fiction or nonfiction. So thank you, Martha, for your work here and on the page. Um, and I'm so excited to read alongside you, Professor Zook, and meet you for officially today for your important work. Um, thank you. So uh, this is um, The Leaving Season, a memoir from not an atomic town. <laughs> Sorry, I just got my two books mixed up. Uh, I've been doing this for a little while. This book came, up, came out in May. And um, I'm really nervous. Uh, all right, I'm going to take a moment. It feels different reading to people who know you, uh, which I think we're probably going to talk about. Uh, in our conversation. So I'll try that again. This is The Leaving Season, a memoir in essays. I'm just going to read the first few pages. So I don't think you should need too much intro. This is called Home Fires. What should we save, Mama? Every year, my children come home asking the same question after the annual fire safety assembly at their elementary school. What should we save if the house is on fire? 
We make plans, the three of us, for what to grab, how to get out, where to meet. We come together at the fire hydrant, in front of our apartment, they decide, its glossy red head a beacon of safety to them. I don't explain that we likely wouldn't be able to get close to the hydrant because the fire truck would need that space, thinking that if the kids made it to the hydrant and I did not, someone would collect them and keep them safe. We won't have a fire anyway, I reassure them. This is all just precaution. Pre-caution, care taken in advance, a kind of controlled burning. But then, this winter, there are two house fires on our street. Both at night, both kitchen fires, a few weeks between them, both houses with children in them. The sirens bring the neighbors out into the middle of the street, and we huddle and remark, point from afar. No one is hurt. Donation pages are created. One house is quickly taped off and under reconstruction within a few weeks, puffs of damaged insulation curling over a dumpster in the driveway like yellowed cotton candy. The other house sits quiet and dark, broken windows covered with plywood, circulars piled on the stoop like wet leaves. The neighborhood children claim the property, climbing the single tree in front of this house day after day, hanging from its limbs in front of the sagging facade, intuitively understanding that this house has been abandoned long before the adults realize. The children have no appetite for nostalgia. Preciousness can't compete with their craving to turn the tree into their own Roxaboxen kingdom. They quickly forget their friends who used to live there, what cars belonged to this driveway. The home's history washes away. The fire, the family, only as real as the sound of a song that just ended. In her book, The Future of Nostalgia, Svetlana Boim calls nostalgia, quote, a longing for a home that no longer exists or has never existed, end quote. There is romance inherent in loss and longing. In order for humans to move on after loss, collective memory shifts and binds together, agreeing on a shared memory of the past or of a place, a new beauty. Boim cautions us against believing in the truth of our nostalgia. We are lulled into trusting that this new beauty, this lie, is safe to believe because access to the past, to home, to a place, to a person is impossible. There is no fact-checking for nostalgia. Years ago, when the boys and I lived with their father in an old farmhouse in the middle of the woods, I obsessed over fire safety. I kept a go bag packed, I tucked fire ladders under the beds, stationed a fire extinguisher in the kitchen, and another near the wood stove. I was so focused on preventing fires inside the house, I was unable to see until it was too late that our fire had been consumed by a less spectacularly dramatic catastrophe. Marriage, after all, is just one long exercise in controlled burning. Every time we do this annual safety exercise, my son's answers change about what they would save. This year at the assembly, the kids were told to choose a pillowcase and fill it with a flashlight and soap, bottled water, and a first aid kit. But they don't care about those things, and our flashlight's battery is dead. They stuff their cases with toys, a taekwondo belt, candy. The boys never ask what I would save. In our apartment, this small space that holds the three of us quietly at the dead end of a tree-filled suburban street, I feel insulated. Perhaps a better word is inoculated, immunized by whatever calamities we've already experienced or escaped. And whatever steel trap we may yet be marching toward, I feel somehow confident that a house fire is not part of those scissored jaws. Still, as I quietly kiss my sons goodnight, their sleeping heads become flames of burnt umber and the streetlights shine through their window. And I play along in my mind. I think of the robin's egg blue box tucked high in my closet with the crusted twigs of my children's umbilical cords, soft nosegays of baby hair from their first haircuts, the nubby flannel blankets they came home in from the hospital. I think of my grandmother's dainty wedding ring tucked inside the faded purple Shalimar clamshell box in the basement. I think of my journals. I also think of all the things I'd leave behind, the things I would let burn. There are so many. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank
Thank you so much for being here as well. And I'm also thrilled to be meeting Professor McMaster and both of you for the first time actually today. And um, we were talking about how difficult it is in front of people you know and trying not to, it's easier to cry in bookstores with strangers than it would be here. So uh, well, hopefully <laughs> there won't be any crying today. But I was so moved by both of these books and there's so many um, interconnections and I hope we can really talk about those because it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, I'm just gonna start with a little bit of the beginning of my book, um, The Girl in the Yellow Poncho, and um, one scene. There were interviews, always interviews, pen and notebook in hand. I rushed here and there to appointments with television and film directors, producers, actors, athletes, and musical artists. As an entertainment and cultural reporter, I wrote features about Magic Johnson, Jamie Foxx, Jada Pinkett Smith, Jill Scott, to name just a few. Later, as I expanded into social justice reporting, there were politicians, activists, entrepreneurs, all manner of change makers. I sat close as they laid out their speeches and plans, hoping that my words would also contribute somehow to the task of lifting as we climbed. I saw myself as a race woman in the old fashioned Ida B. Wells sense of the word, a journalist who dug deep to lay bare injustices and hold a mirror to our collective triumph and trauma. I was down for the cause, despite what some may have seen when they looked at me. I knew that my nearly white appearance put me at the periphery of this landscape, and yet I claimed it as my own. Raised by my African-American mother and grandmother, where else was I going to go? I was light-skinned, but for me, there was no question of being anything but black. Still, for many years, I held on to a secret shame and deep insecurities. My white father had abandoned my mother before I was born, sending a message that locked itself into my psyche. I was unworthy of a man's love, unworthy of white protection, unworthy of the picturesque and always white family life I saw on television. To add to my humiliation, a father figure next door violated my innocence as a child, <clears throat> confirming that I did not belong to the tribe of girls who were to be cherished. I wrestled with these demons of sexual assault, trauma, abandonment, and racial shame for the first four decades of my life. <laughs> and when I say wrestled, I mean literally knocked down to the ground, kicking and punching, wrestled. I journeyed across oceans, I prayed, I counseled. Time and again, I beat back the temptation to sink into a long history of generational drug and alcohol addiction that, had that was entrenched on both the white and the black sides of my family tree. I would be whole, I decided, even if I had to grab the devil of my past by the throat and wrench the air from his lungs in a gladiatorial do or, fight, do or die fight to the death. I did that. I took him on and I won. Today, my lost father is found and amazingly present. So too is my mother, an unexpected piece of my happy ending puzzle. Somehow, against all odds, I've managed to create the family of my dreams with a husband I adore, a lovely step stepdaughter, and my sunshine, our six, now seven-year-old daughter, I could not have done that without faith, an open heart, and a determination to heal. In this book, I take a journey back to a time when I recognized the power of others to move mountains, but couldn't quite see the brightness of my own star. This story is my testament to the power of forgiveness and settling into one's own authentic identity. In short, it's my rediscovery <clears throat> of a little girl who once stood tall and joyful in her favorite yellow poncho. I'm just going to read uh, one scene from 
the beginning of the book. Um, it's called Uncle Mervin. Did you brush your teeth? Mom asked. We were warm and cozy under a freshly laundered chenille bedspread. For a special treat and because it was Valentine's Day, Mom had let me eat Fig Newtons and stay up past my bedtime so we could watch Hawaii Five O together. We were like two bugs in a rug, she said. A rare treat indeed. Usually I brushed my teeth like clockwork. I was a good girl who did pretty much everything Mom and Dra asked without complaint. Dra was the name for my grandmother. That's what we called her. But it was nearly 11 o'clock and I was just too tired. Instead, I ran the toothbrush under the water and <laughs> placed it back in the cup. Zuki, my eyes were closed, but I could hear my mom smiling. Did you really brush your teeth? How did she know? Ugh. Off I trudged back to the bathroom to finish the job. Drawn Lisa, Lisa's my cousin, who I grew up with. She's on the cover with me. We're asleep at the back of the apartment when we heard a sudden knock. Ours was a tranquil residential neighborhood. With the television off and the shooting and car chases done, the house was silent. We had no dog or cat, not even a hamster to spin around on a wheel. It was just us. Mom and I exchanged confused looks. We weren't the kind of family that got visitors, even during daylight hours. Mom and Dra didn't have casual girlfriends or chatty neighborhood acquaintances. In those early years, they mostly kept to themselves. Mom padded into the living room with me tracking close behind. I pressed myself be behind her legs as she studied the peephole. Slowly, with impending dread, she opened the door. Is this the home of Mervyn Brent? I felt my mother crumple beside me. She stared back at two uniformed police officers. I'm his sister. My uncle Mervyn had trafficked marijuana from Tijuana to Los Angeles for some time to support his heroin addiction. He was good at it until he wasn't. He got caught and was sent away to a minimum security prison. I remember, oh, after he got out, she, he met Jane, a soft-spoken Texan with porcelain skin. I remember she drove a burgundy Cadillac and sang along to all the easy hits on the radio. The night they met, she and my uncle sat up together on a bench at Venice Beach talking. Jane was different. She had absolutely no experience with drugs or drug dealers. With her in his life, Mervyn turned a corner. He checked himself into a rehabilitation program at UCLA and got clean. He signed up for job training as a welder, and before long, he earned his first legal paycheck. He was spending more time with us, taking us to IHOP, which for me was nothing short of a five-star restaurant. Is there a man of the house? One of the officers asked. Dra joined us then, tightening her robe. What is this concerning? Ma'am? He nodded. The officer's tone was surprisingly gentle. Mom would later wonder if he was uncomfortable delivering his news to two women and a small girl. I'm sorry to inform you, this is concerning the death of Mervyn Brent. Oh, Mom turned to me, desolate. My grandmother caught herself against a wall. Lord have mercy. The officer paused long enough for them to find their bearings. The cause of death appears to have been a drug overdose, heroin. When she finally spoke, my mo mother's voice was thick with emotion. Where is he? The officer glanced at his notes. He was found in a vacant drug house, 562 North Serrano Avenue. To this day, mom can still recite the address from memory. Uncle Mervyn's attempts to get clean had come too late, she said. He just slid back. While we stood frozen at the door, Lisa slept peacefully in her bed, unaware of how her life was about to change. After Mervyn's death, my mother closed the door to her bedroom, to our bedroom, most days, and stayed there stayed there for what felt like hours, sobbing over her tarot cards. 
Arranging symbols across our bed, she studied the images and then shuffled and tried again. We didn't have a stereo, so mom used my plastic kids' turntable to play a 45 single of Frank Sinatra's My Way over and over and over again. It was her ode to Mervyn, their shared swan song of defeat. What I didn't know then was that during all those hours sequestered in our bedroom, mom was not only mourning her brother, she was also grieving the loss of her own innocence. She must have realized by then that my father, a drug addict and alcoholic, was also well and truly gone. She would be a single mother after all. Mom's brother, grandfather, and a host of other family members were addicted to drugs or alcohol or both. Draw believed that we'd been cursed as a family. Perhaps at that point, Mom was starting to ag agree. I'm just skipping ahead. We were a house of single working women and girls with not a single husband, father, grandfather, brother, or uncle in sight. Fernando Noche, who lived not three feet away across the hallway, must have known this. And with that knowledge, he inched closer to his prey. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <clears throat> Thanks, Karen, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be reading with the two of you, and I, um, uh, I love knowing that we're all here at Hofstra and uh, taking on the memoir form, and I look forward to speaking about it. I'm going to read from um, s s the second half of my book. Uh, oh, it's Omega Farm. It's um, the story of my return home to my childhood home during the pandemic, with my two children who are almost grown and um, my husband and our pets to take care of my mother who has advanced dementia. Um, I got involved with a lot of things, when a lot of caretaking when I was there, my mother primarily, but it, various things led me to also take care of her forest. And this is a passage in which I'm beginning to ad address that. Mark had told me about a moment in the lockdown COVID spring of 2020 in late March when buds were forming on the trees and a day could sometimes be, despite the wind, if you lay down on the ground for a moment in a coat, as he did, and watched the dogs cavort in the tall grass, and if you listened to the wind rise and fall in the forest, such a day could feel almost sunny and warm. On one such day, Mark had walked with the dogs past the chicken coop and along the south edge of a fence line that followed the big 10-acre field east of the main house and garden. We'd fantasized about planting rows of lavender in that, in that field. It wasn't out of the realm of possibility. Farmers planted lavender in New Jersey. To get out of the wind, Mark had lain down in his coat and watched the woods. He'd been married to me for almost 20 years. He'd been coming to the farm with me longer than that, a witness to the spectacle that my family could sometimes be. He knew my stepfather, my grandmother, the fights I could get into with my sisters. On our wedding day, for her speech, Joan raised her glass to Mark and said, laughing, and by way of famili family embrace, familial embrace, you can't ever say that you didn't know what you were getting into. Mark understood the stories about all the baggage, or most of it, and mostly because of this, he had always felt, like almost everyone else did, that the farm, for as beautiful as it was, had a strange, brittle weirdness about it, contained too many ghosts, too many stories that too many people just wanted to forget. Being at the farm had always made him feel as if he were living inside a Chekhov or Ibsen play, a play that takes place in a threadbare, tumbled-down estate with a family gathered, all the old grudges and grievances unsheathed, the, conversation, the conversations filled with knives and stabbing jokes, all of this against the backdrop of societal upheaval taking place beyond their world. Because of this, Mark had always kept the farm at an emotional distance. 
but lying just out of the wind in the sun and looking at the trees and the field that could be lavender. He said the size of his life seemed very small, and the size and scope of the forest seemed suddenly to dwarf any family drama, any human drama, any human who might have ever passed this way at any time in history or prehistory. He squinted in the sun to watch the play of the wind in the trees. Against that scale of time, we were nothing. It was like standing next to a mountain and understanding how little anything that ever happened to you mattered or would ever matter to anyone. And somehow this perspective was deeply calming for him and then for me too, as I became engaged with ideas of aiding the forest. He recalled this moment of his lying in the field, studying the forest, giving it to me as a sort of invitation it wasn't acquiescence. It wasn't something out of Schopenhauer. It had the opposite effect one might expect. I recognized something in Mark's story. A calm settled over me, too, born of curiosity, as we, begin to, as we began to shoulder the notion of restor restoring the forest. I wasn't worried about the project's colossal scale. It both made me feel more alive and gave me a new understanding of what I could be doing here. And by here, I, be, I, be, I began to mean, increasingly, that portion of time and place I had been allotted on this earth, how tiny that was, how little one person could do, but also th that this was a recognition of proper, that is to say, sane and manageable limits. It wasn't a limitation to recognize limits. It was, in fact, liberating. It would not fall to me or my husband alone to solve the pro this problem. We would face it and join with others, perhaps our children and relatives, our friends, my sisters, and we would begin the slow, good work of restoration. It would place, take place a across many lifetimes. It was good to do, and it was good to begin. I kept thinking of the famous opening of The Joy of Cooking that tome of human wisdom about food and cuisine, which at the outset offers a helpful, practical moment of orientation for the reader to the colossal task at hand, stand facing the stove. I'll stop there. Thank you. Are these on? Yes. So where to begin here? There's so much. Um, so I'll just jump right in, selfishly. Um, you know, we all seem to be writing about, um, well, secrets and um, things that, you know, a lot of people don't say. Uh, you know, the stories behind a divorce your all of your your experiences with with race with the incident you ended with with um, your father um, there there's a lot we're hiding from um, so I'd like to know how you are both so people say I'm brave which um, when I talk about my book and it's weird because it it makes me bristle a little not because I don't um, welcome the the, the compliment, because I know it's such, to be brave is to be powerful and strong. Um, but there's also maybe a sadness in it that um, they're recognizing that I'm brave because I'm doing something that they might not be able to do. You guys have done that as well. And so can you speak to, to what, that, what it takes, what that experience was like? Yeah, I, I found it really interesting that you also talked a little bit about Me Too and that our experiences happened so long before Me Too, and I wondered, you know, well, you hadn't talked about it, I guess, over the years, and I had not I had a little bit, but, well, with your family you had, yeah. but um, when you, I, there's so much to say, but when you talk about bravery, I think about that too, and I think that I don't know if I could have written this book the way I did if it hadn't been for Me Too. And if it, you know, if we weren't coming into this age where it's, it needs to be said, um, and so, you know, and even the the 
if you want to call it the sense of violence of you know your husband pulling a gun um, all of these men don't fare very well in any of these books <laughs> I've noticed um, my but, husband does <laughs> your husband does but he's in the he's sort of in the background a little bit and so yeah my husband does too but but um, you know just speaking out about the violence that's been done um, to us for so long in generations long before me too I think is the bravery of of, of not us, but so many women who've made it possible to, to speak and write mm -hmm. in this way. I, I know a few of my students are here. Um, and the other day, I drew very poorly uh, the periodic table of um, what I call human emotion. <laughs> um, and so the idea that uh, although it felt in the writing that I was writing something dangerous, scary, very alone, right? Um, what has been wonderful is meeting the reader um, after publication and realizing there's absolutely nothing that I've gone through that other people haven't, right? And, um, and the idea that that is why, in, in my class, I, I tease the students that they, um, you know, they should look for the shame when you are feeling shame and feeling like there's something that um, I shouldn't be writing down. The act of writing down is so powerful and sometimes or reading it aloud right um, and I think that was the power in me too stand and then you are able only then are you able to stand alongside other people and realize it's collective um, and there's power in that and I think at almost every reading that I've been to reading from this book uh, someone will come up afterwards and there was one in Chicago um, this older woman who was probably in her 80s, and she just came up to me and said, it took me 25 years. And I knew that she meant to leave, right? Uh, and there's this, um, there wasn't sadness, there wasn't pride, it was just, yeah, me too, in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think on the other side of the writing, that's what kept, what kept me coming back to the page, right? Because I did know so many people who needed this story. Um, and that, I think, is what, what, make it, what makes me feel brave in that way. Um, that's where I see the bravery is not, um, it's not like a badge, but it's like being the first one to jump in a pool, <laughs> right? <laughs> and actually, speaking of... Um, the way men and women fare in our books. Um, I loved the sense of, it almost felt like this chorus of uh, really complicated but strong women in our books, um, sort of standing behind, like almost like this Greek chorus. <laughs> um, and, and I wondered, uh, for me, it wasn't, uh, my book is in essays, so there are 19 essays um, and then collected through a narrative arc, but. Um, but I didn't set out initially to write a full memoir from beginning to end. Uh, so it was interesting once I put them together to notice right patterns. So um, and these the way that these sort of uh, women in my life in particular kept saving me um, was something for me that then when it was a full memoir, I was able to pull out more um, and, and highlight. But I wondered. Um, at what point, or if that was something, as you were writing, that you focused on in terms of the the way that you portrayed women and men, or women versus men, or just women uh, in your books? Well, I started out thinking this was going to be a book about looking for my father. And um, it really became a much deeper story about healing the generations of black women in my family and that my mother had e experienced a kind of trauma um, as a young wom woman pregnant giving birth alone and my grandmother had experienced many traumas back in the day in Southside Chicago when she was a young woman and that those traumas had been passed on to us to Lisa and I and I think you said it in years that it, generational traumas are Right, yeah. uh, uh, that they're that they're generational, that they, and so um, 
that became a, mu a much more intense story because I didn't realize that it was my mother and I that needed the healing most. And um, I like to say that the healing is has a domino effect because I started out wanting to heal myself and it, it translated into healing the relationship with my father, which then there's a surprise at the end. My father and mother healed something that they needed to heal after 50 years. And then that in turn led to a healing between my mother and I, which was the deepest healing of all and completely unexpected. So I do think women <laughs> definitely take on a much more important role in, in this book and in my life than, than men have. Um, and that's clearly part of my consciousness and part of my identity. It's not, it's something that's surprising at all. It's, it's always the core of, of, of who I am. So, yeah. Um, I have, I have uh, four sisters and four stepsisters. So women are very um, much a part of my life. And, um, but when I started, so they're, they're just always there in everything I write. My last novel was all about women. There were hardly any men in it. And I didn't even realize that until somebody pointed it out. But with this, actually, when I started this, it was um, supposed to be, in fact, when I wrote the proposal, it was a book about restoring my mother's forest. It was not a book about family um, inherited family trauma or any of that. It was a, a book about eradicating a bamboo grove that led me into into the forest. But as I was writing it, and I wrote it very fast, and I, I wasn't thinking about my mother, you know, like, is this about my mother? Um, that's what came out. It was, I was there to take care of my mother um, during the pandemic, so it made sense. And um, I wrote it in a month and realized uh, that it, my childhood was inextric inextricably bound to hacking away at the bamboo and trying to get rid of it and then trying to nurture these trees. And it wasn't a planned metaphor. It just happened. And um, that surprised me a lot, which um, leads me to a, a question. What surprised you in writing the book? Because certainly um, stuff does. Um, Joan Didion says, I write to understand what happened. And I think for me that, that surprise was that this wasn't, it was another family story. Um, how about for you guys? Um, I would say I thought similarly, where you start and you think, oh, this is what I'm writing. And then you write it and then you realize, oh, actually I wrote a completely different book. Um, I think, uh, a little different this time was that there was a book I did not want to write. I did not want this to be just a divorce book, just. Um, <laughs> and so I, um, I think in fighting that so hard, I, um, uh, I almost psyched myself out and um, hid uh, my ex from from sight in many ways. And my editor said, you know, um, every divorce story starts as a love story. And I had to go back uh, after I thought I was finished with the book uh, and rewrite and, and go back and fall in love again on the page, which was um, actually really healing and, and helpful to um, be generous on the page to somebody that uh, is kind of hard to be generous to in, in real life. And I think the surprise at the end was that the story wasn't really about him at all. And uh, it was about really me sort of falling in love with being a mother. Uh, and that was not something I intended to set out to do, but understanding that, uh, that for me, uh, becoming a single mom and uh, having that home with my sons was its own love story. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful that that's where it ended, but that was not where I thought it was headed. That was one of my questions also, because the, the forest story is so different than what came out. And I was curious if, you know, um, I started as a journalist wanting to write about multiracial youth <laughs> and this generation of multiracial youth, um, because there's just been, you know, an exponential increase in the, since my generation. I was early um, 1960s, and there were no, uh, you know, interracial marriage was still illegal. 
um, in many states. And there were no advertisements with mixed race kids. There were no you know, TV shows. There was nothing. And even as late as 2013, I don't, if you, you've all seen the Cheerios ad, the little girl, that was pulled, right? So still a lot going on around um, multiracial identity. And I, I was curious about this generation because a lot of my students are more comfortable with claiming, you know, they're black Pino and Blasian. And, <laughs> and on social media, they're not afraid to claim all these different sides of themselves, which was unheard of in my generation living under the one drop rule, um, which was codified in this country. Uh, and, you know, culturally, if you're one drop black, you're black legally, right? And so um, I wanted to write about that as a journalist. and. Along the way, you know, the book was uh, the proposal was out there, and um, there we had a potential publisher who was very interested. And then uh, another publisher said she liked the small pieces of my own story better <laughs> than I'm like, but I'm a journalist. You don't like my journalism? <laughs> I was a little offended by that. But she said, No, I like. I think you should open up some of this personal narrative and. Um, I was thinking about it at the same time that my daughter was one, and I, at that point, hadn't seen my father, and I didn't know where he was 14 years. I didn't know if he was alive or dead. And I was thinking about her as a multiracial girl growing up, and would she know her, her grandfather, and you know, all of those questions that you that you have. And it just kind of evolved. It just came out as a memoir over time. Um, I'm thinking about uh, when we're writing about somebody that we're angry at, how tricky that is. Because I remember when I was writing my second novel, which had to do with my stepfather, and it's called Gorgeous Lies. I, I would give my mother everything to read. And she read it. It's about her husband. He was dead, but he was had still been her husband. And his char the character's name was Anton, and um, my stepfather's name is Dan. My mother said, you can hate Dan, but you can't hate Anton, which was really important to, for me to understand, because if you hate your character too much, it's black and white. It's, one so it's like two-dimensional or even one-dimensional. So how did you navigate that? Um, in the writing, when you are so, you know, you are angry at these situations and these people, um, and to keep, you know, that balance or to keep the, I don't know if it's fairness or just to keep it um, the equilibrium. Equilibrium. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I, I think, in the writing, you. I mean, I cried so many tears writing, and, and you know, so many emotions came out, and so much anger that um, I think that's how you navigate it. It it has to come out. It's something that just, you know, what we do is we let it fester for so so long that it eats us on the inside. And the act of writing for me, and I wanted to ask you all about journals, but um, the act of writing is what is how you deal with that anger for for me, and. Also on the page, there are some scenes where you see I kind of uh, pl uh, let my anger play out in real time. I'm always <clears throat> knocking on <clears throat> knocking on doors of strangers, you know, like as a journalist trying to get answers and trying to force people to talk to me and tell me the truth. And so <clears throat> I think that, that in itself was uh, I hate to keep saying healing, but it was healing and and when I finished the book, and especially after publication, I can't describe the feeling of lightness. Mm -hmm. That I don't know if you both have that, but I feel enormous. Yes, it's scary, and yes, it's all out there, but just a lightness, like it's off of my shoulders. Yeah, yeah I, I, I definitely think the writing is different than therapy, for example, right? It's, it's a different process, but they're, they might sometimes twin in, um, in place, and uh, for me, I always write an angry draft. <laughs> it's sort of like um, uh, in some classes, I'll have my students write like a, the, the letter that they didn't send, right? Where when you're a teenager and you're really mad at your boss or something, and you're 
you write that email and you don't hit send. Um, and I think, I think those are critical, right? Because for me, so much of um, so much of the problem is the my lack of anger. And so it's easier for me to get angry on the page, and and alone <laughs> in a room, right? Uh, and so, but then I need to put it away, and I need distance, and let other things filter in, um, and also imagine, right? And that's the difference between a journal and something that you're going to um, put out into the world. Imagine other people reading it, not necessarily the person you're angry at, but people who love them, um, and. Uh, I think revision and drafts and time uh, for me were critical for that. Um, and it doesn't solve anything, right? It doesn't change. Um, it helped me understand that maybe it wasn't, my anger was maybe misdirected. Uh, so maybe I wasn't so angry at this person, but I was angry at the death of this fantasy that I had about that person. Um, and then that's easier for me to deal with, right? That's mine that I can solve uh, rather than it being out there. Um, but I, I love what you said. There's, there is such a relief in, you know, when people read this and as a reader's experience, they read through it and then they go get the next book, right? Um, and I get to put it on the shelf too when I'm done. And that is such a wonderful feeling. Yeah. Um, and I think Martha in your book, um, you're, you are so, um, it's, it's such a tough subject and one that has touched my family too, dementia. You are so angry at dementia and the way that you draw that out on the page, um, I've never really seen that written in that way before, but anger in so many ways can be powerful and letting people see, right? It doesn't need to be controlled and sanitized, right? Allowing that anger to come out on the page is also human and I think part of memoir. I love that too when you put your mother back to bed and gave her a quick kiss, a cold <clears throat> I think you said a cold kiss a cold quick kiss <laughs> uh, you, yeah you feel that my grandmother had Alzheimer's but it wasn't anywhere near that point um, when she died so she still knew who we were and all that so it was but yeah I could, I could definitely relate can I ask about structure? Yours is, um, I mean, yours is more conventional like mine. There's, you know, we're telling a, a story with an arc. Yours isn't, and you, you spoke a little bit about that. Um, how did you come up with doing it in essays instead of as a, as a, you know, as a more traditional narrative? I thought it was really cool. I loved it. Um, but I, it, it is different, so I, I thought you could speak to that. Yeah, so my um, beginning as a writer is in journalism, that I was a journalist first. Uh, well, actually, I was a really terrible poet first in, <laughs> in college, uh, and, uh, and then I became a journalist, and, uh, and then I found the essay form. And it was, talk about falling in love. That, for me, was probably the... Um, the most romantic love affair of my life. Uh, and I still feel it every day. I'm so excited when I fall into a new essay, whether I'm writing it or reading it. What is it about the form that you uh, fell in love with? There's, there's a, um, they're, like on a, they're so different on a cellular level um, that you can uh, just fall so deeply into an essay and then come right back out in this uh, small, there's a student in my memoir class right now, and she keeps using this word pocket, um, and it feels like a pocket. You just uh, fall into a pocket, and then you can just pop back out, and it's a whole world. It's, it's um, the way I imagine, you know, um, my son was a kangaroo for, <laughs> for Halloween, and it's the way I imagine a baby kangaroo, right, a joey would feel like going into the kangaroo's pouch. There's a whole world in there, and from the outside, you would never know what that, it's, it looks like it's not even there. But then you're in, and it's, it's just its own universe. And I feel like in a, the power of an essay, um, it can be anything, and you can go anywhere, and you can expand into dreams and imagination and um, you know, bend the rules of nonfiction and fiction and journalism and um, beauty and uh, dialogue and all the stuff, or none of it. And 
uh, it feels like this open frontier where um, I had just I still don't really know what to expect, and I love that about the essay. And so it's really fun for me to move into a space. I think there are lots of um, topics and themes that are not necessarily linear, um, right? Uh, grief, and this really is a book about grief. Um, I think grief is not linear in the way that humans experience it, and so I had a hard time facing my topic straight on. So it was much easier for me to sort of, um, it's almost like fishing, right? Just sort of dart in, let it go down, and then come back out, and then approach it from a different angle. And it was, um, it quieted my anxiety about facing this sort of um, giant topic that felt unmanageable in book form, right? Capital B book. Um, and when I look at my first book, I realize uh, my chapters are really essays hidden uh, <laughs> as chapters. Um, but I think, I think, and I don't know if it's the same way with short stories and novels, but, um, but there's just something that, uh, for me, it's the only way that I, I felt that I could honestly represent this experience um, as I was going through it. With yours, I noticed it, you, you, um, you also, ha like the scene you read, they're so immediate, and you take us right back to that moment in you know, childhood. It feels almost like fiction, like I'm inside a scene, or like a detailed diary entry. Um, how, did you, how did you conceive your structure? When you, did you conceive it as writing, or beforehand did you have a, a sense of how you wanted it to? Structure is kind of a bad word for me. <laughs> it's, it, as a journalist, I just, you know, I wasn't trained as, in fiction or memoir, and it was really, really hard to figure out structure for me. But I knew that overall it was a quest to find my father over, over and over and over again and to heal that. And, but underneath that, there were so many layers of experience and, um, trauma and you know on different levels whether it was racial or um, sexual assault gender right and um, so that was interwoven in this quest to you know with my father um, but I, I always feel like I'm not very good at structure and I'm, I don't really know what I'm doing um, but I did, I did want to talk about journals because a lot of it is my, like this book couldn't have been written without my journal. Fascinating. So my class that meets right now is the journal writing class. So listen up, guys. Yeah. Yeah, I've been keeping journals since I was 12. And, you know, the childhood part was the hardest because you don't have journals. But um, uh, a little fun fact, I went to school with Slash of Guns N' Roses and I don't think I would have even remembered our interactions if I didn't have it in my journal. I mean, I quoted from the journal that, you know, he, he's, he's, because I had a crush on him. And, and Lisa, my, Lisa telling me that he was making goo goo eyes at me. We were the only two biracial kids that I remember. And he had a black mom too, which was like a big deal because most usually it was the black dads. And so a lot of that was just directly from my journals. Um, and I, I was telling, a, uh, actually, I was telling my daughter's class of second graders <laughs> last week, my most, my toughest audience yet. <laughs> I was telling them that journals are the only place where you can be completely free, and that, you know, don't worry about the book. Worry, put, get, just get everything in the journals first, because later you can always decide. Well, this I like, this I, I don't like, this I'm leaving, but. This is the journal is where you can just be completely, totally free. What compelled you to start keeping journals as a twelve-year-old? Probably all the issues that I was having and all the questions and frustration and um, you know, like, like I said, this started as a, a question about being biracial, really, because there was no one to look at, and it's hard for you all maybe to imagine today, but. Uh, there was there were there were no interracial couples. You didn't see it anywhere in culture. Lisa and I had this really big hair that was always poofing out, so we always felt really different. And um, 
we didn't have the white side. Coincidentally, she didn't have her white mother either. So none, we had nobody white around us, so we were in a black family, and yet we looked white, more or less. So um, I had a lot of questions and issues, and <clears throat> I, I think I started it right around the same time you know, I was writing about Slash and like, oh, <laughs> he's, he's biracial too, this is cool. And just trying to get my feelings out and trying to figure out who I was, right? Kelly, do you keep a journal? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. I read that. Yes, um, and I'm, I'm serious that if, if the house was on fire, that it, forget about the baby books and the <laughs> passports or whatever else. My, my journals would be the first mm. thing. And, um, and it, it interests me academically because journals are considered primary sources, right? Um, and yet, right, I do not consider my journals as fact uh, in, in my experience, right? I mean, you can, it's your private playground you can fantasize you can lie you can you know um, do whatever you want and most of mine I, I recently visited Abigail Thomas who's 82 lives in Woodstock now and is another one of my favorite writers and she sat down and she said oh I'm getting rid of all my journals I was like what she said oh they're so boring it's just full of recipes and who came over for dinner I was like I will take them I want to know what you're cooking and who's coming over for dinner like that's that's though that domestic part I think is especially in women's lives so interesting because it's alongside everything else right the way that we hold the domestic in our head um, when I look at my own journals it's amazing where the the like sort of right love right teenage love and this really deep lifelong what did you say four decades consideration of your biracial life uh, starting on the page of a journal um, like those two things together right it's not that you sat down to write the one but that we have themes within or I certainly in my journals I wind up opening one and 10 years later I'm like oh my god I'm still writing about this <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's important and I think it it works itself out and and I wondered I still can't believe that you wrote this in a month, Martha. Um, well, I mean, I should say, then I put it in a drawer for six months. <laughs> yes. And then I edited it for, you know, it took of me course. some time. Yeah, so. but, but it came out oh. start to finish really fast. Yeah. But do you feel like you had been writing it longer? Yeah. I felt like I had been writing it my whole life. In fact, uh, yeah, I've written several novels about that have stuff to do with my family, and it's, some of these themes are hiding in there. So, and that, that's an interesting thing to be, you know, a novelist, that's what I am, but then to take on some of the same material accidentally in a memoir was cool, <laughs> surprising. Should we open it? I don't know. I don't know. Let's do that. If there, are questions. <laughs> if there are questions from you guys, we'd love to hear them, and I can keep asking questions. So. But if you have questions, I'd love to hear them. I know my students have questions. <laughs> You're being graded. <laughs> yeah. So I'll get things started. Uh, thank you so much to, to all three of you. Um, Martha, I know you said in, in your book that the, the forest um, functions as, as a metaphor, but I, I hope you don't mind a question where I ask about it quite literally. Um, how are the trees? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking. I care so much about them. In fact, next weekend, um, I'm going to dig up some trees um, that I, so uh, part of this forest restoration is growing trees above deer grazing height, which I do in a former paddock. And then I move them when they're about seven, eight feet tall into the forest and I protect them. And I did that last year for the first time after growing them for two years. This year I had seven remaining that weren't tall enough, but they are now and they've got to go because their taproot will just get too deep and I won't be able to move them. So it will defeat the purpose. So they're, they're doing well and it's, it's a constant battle and I'm not out there enough. This year I planted 50 new trees in, in the paddock to um, get above deer grazing height. 
I wasn't out there, so when um, they arrived, the, the person taking care of my mom put them in water, and I think she drowned them. I buried them, and I mean, buried them. <laughs> I, I planted them anyway, and I'm hoping that they'll miraculously uh, arrive next year, but it still very much interests me, and I, I, you know, it's good work. Thanks for asking that. I, one of my questions uh, was also about home, and you both went to this back into this rural setting, right? And um, I, I, I really appreciated how you both, in different ways, acknowledged, um, <laughs> I, I guess, more openly, Martha, the environment of you know Trump and the fear, or maybe you know. Of, of these gun-toting sort of, you know, people, and then the swastika, swastika that was, in my mind for a long time, I thought it was a Confederate flag, but then I went back and I said, no, because in my mind, I felt fear being in your, <laughs> being in your home place. And it, I just was interested because in some ways we all were trying to find a home. I went back to my childhood home where there was fear to confront my abuser but it, you know, it was in a rural setting, and when I was in both of your settings, I felt I could never go there because I, you know, I've been in places where, especially depending on how my hair is or who I'm with, they recognize me as black, and I, I could never go there, and I kept thinking, <laughs> you know, feeling fear for you or, or, you know, for myself if I were to be in those places. But I really appreciated how you acknowledged. Um, Black Lives Matter, you acknowledged that this was the summer of George Floyd and the explosiveness and even looking around where you were, um, you know, that that was part of this scene, the, the conflict and the tension. Can you talk about that? Um, well, thank you for bringing that up. Um, you know, I was, I, I, when, you're, when you're writing in your journal or um, anywhere, this is what I do um, for my, my life, um, you want to observe accurately. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't have written about that time. This was the pandemic without 2020, 21. I couldn't have written that without being completely conscious of Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and, um, and, and the area I was living in, which is uh, Hunterdon County, New Jersey. It's, it, 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 it it's very Republican, but it was Democratic for a little while, but now it's back to being re Republican. Um, and there, it's, it's a rural area with, you know, just you know, a lot of farmers and a lot of, um, a lot of guns, um, a lot of shooting ranges near my mother's you house. You were even targeted, your home, I mean. Yeah, well, they knocked down our, our, our signs, and I realized it was, our, uh, what was it, Bi was it Biden? Biden. Oh my God. I'm just lost. Where, is, where are we in time? The pandemic is so weird. So yeah, that was that was felt threatening, um, and so uh, yeah, it was just observing really, and it was uh, it was part of the experience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it felt important to you know just include everything, but especially that. Yeah, but this idea of a home that you love that you're trying to create is in the middle of a place that for me represents fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I was writing pre-Trump, but what was interesting to edit during that time period was to see all of the seeds pointing in that direction and try to try to remain truthful in the writing of it, right? That I, I could never know that that was going to come. And yet, when we look at patterns, um, right, the idea that there was that flag with a swastika in that barn that I stood under not knowing for so long. Um, it's one of the most painful moments of the book for me. And once, because once you do see it, you can't unsee it. And, um, and it called into question the whole hill, right? Um, and I think there's something about home, right? There's, I mean, I've, I've thought a lot about this in terms of the anthology I worked on and, and why I think it's so fascinating and maybe what you're feeling is that, um, you know, home can be a four-letter word as well and it's it's the first place we're loved but it's also the first place we feel fear and hate and 
all of it. Um, and so I think that's, for better or for worse, good narrative, right? It's that idea of what we hope home is or could be, uh, and then it, we hold it against the reality sometimes, and that's right. Country, beauty, um, pastoral, um, it's so lovely there, and yet, right, when you're actually, the reality of it, um, that, that combination of um, savagery and beauty is what really drew me to, to that section of the book of writing about that area because um, there's, there's something um, so conflicted um, and even with those people, right? Um, I mean, they, in this particular group of men in the barn, um, were uh, in many ways the most ingenious, you know, engineers and helped each other. And yet they also had that flag in their barn and that I can't solve that in my head. And so that's when I know I need to turn to the page. Yes, you want to come up to the microphone? Hi. So, James Frey, uh, the uh, Million Little Pieces guy, mm -hmm. uh, his, his reputation was ruined um, uh, because he, he fabricated everything. He, he tried to do a con. Around the same time, uh, Bob Dylan releases his memoir. And that's full of lies, too. But they're full of really interesting, uh, fun lies. And the lies are too big to possibly get away with. He's a famous guy. Um, my question is, uh, in reading or, or writing memoirs, have there been instances when you have thought, you know, uh, a lie here or a, a fabrication is more uh, honest on the um, emotional or like the ecstatic truth level. Thanks. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is that um, you can't lie. <laughs> but uh, if you get something wrong, then you need to fix it. And when I was writing, um, there, I was writing about a therapy session that my entire family, like 10 kids and my parents went to when we were mostly adult. <laughs> which was just a crazy situation. And I was, my stepfather was there and he got really angry in the middle of it. And I was sure it was because my little sister was there and he was afraid that I was gonna say something that she would hear. That was my memory. And I wrote it that way. And then I, I, t I was asking my sister, I wasn't asking her about this, but I, we were talking about that therapy session because it was sort of famous in our family. And she said, I wasn't there. And I said, yes, you were. You were there. I just wrote that you were there. You were there. And so I then I, and so the whole scene made sense to me that she was there. So I didn't change that scene. But right after it ended, I wrote about talking to my sister. And that was the way I addressed it, that she actually wasn't there. Because memory is really weird and cool. And it tr makes tricks. Uh, and so, but you have to address it. You can't lie, or you are going to get up with um, James Spray and yeah. into trouble. I don't. I didn't know about the lies and Bob Dylan, so I can't really speak to that. Yeah, and I think you went further than you know. As a journalist, I, I didn't document the way you did at the end. All this is where everything came from. This is how I pieced this together. Um, I, I felt like memoir is by nature subjective and it, it's always going to be flawed it's always memory is always flawed um you know i did my best to talk to my family about things but there are places where we disagreed and you know my mom was adamant that her, growing up in south side chicago in the ghetto as she called it wasn't as bad as i portrayed it as well um what impacted me as the next generation was the trauma of that experience, especially for my grandmother. And so that's my story. And <laughs> it's my story to tell. I mean, I have so many examples of that. Um, not to keep going back to Slash, but his girlfriend <laughs> wrote to me on Facebook to correct some things. <laughs> and I was like, but this is my yeah. memory. And it's also Lisa's memory of you know our 
whatever shy relationship. We barely spoke to each other, so there wasn't much of a relationship. But this is my experience. And so I feel like it, it's a very different undertaking than being a journalist for me, which was what made it also difficult. Like, you have to leave that aside and just tell the story that as you know it and that you need to tell. And the other thing I'll say is that my entire family, I say this in the book, has large chunks of memory that are missing. And we all believe that that's from trauma. That's our way of dealing with things. We're perpetually sunny. We're perpetually fighters. And we just push it down, push it down. And, and so I would go to, you know, there's a scene, there's a very important scene that where something happened, someone was bleeding, and none of us know <laughs> who that was or why. It's kind of strange. My mother doesn't know. Um, Lisa doesn't know. She thinks it's me. I think it was her. Um, and so you, that's what I wrote. I, those are my favorite moments. <laughs> um, when, when you realize you are lying on the page, and then you're like, whoa, why? why what am I afraid of? Um, why don't I should step back here and figure this out, right? Um, and and that's different than someone else saying, "Oh, this is this is not right, right?" I've certainly had that happen in in my books too. And um, but that's that's the trick of it. I mean, I teach a class called track, uh, fact versus fiction, or sorry, <laughs> fact versus truth. And um, history is not fact, right? Um, I mean, in the way that often it's taught, the way my children are learning history, that's not any more truthful than memoir, right? It's, it's, a, it's a viewpoint. Um, and, and I think what matters is the contract with the reader. So if you have, and, and there's a spectrum of response from different writers, you know, there are plenty of practitioners who do think it is, it's the beauty of the line that matters most. That is not where I fall. I don't know if it's from the journalistic background, um, but I love that the novelist answered first and said, you can't do that. Um, so, but that's, I think, the contract with the reader is, I am telling you what I believe to be true, my own truth, um, and I will tell you on the page if I'm not sure, or I will tell you on the page if I lie um, inadvertently. But I remember in my first book, um, I gave it to my mother, uh, and there were some really hard things about her life that she's a very private person that she I thought she would have trouble with. And the only line she pulled out was this moment where um, I'm describing the house next door, and uh, there and I write something about junk cars up on cement blocks, right? Everybody knows that kind of image. Um, and she <laughs> she circled that and said, "They were vintage." <laughs> um, but that I think what I recognize in maybe your mother's response, right, is that idea of in her mind there's some pride mm -hmm. aspect happening that where did I move my family to, right? Where, where did I, what was I in charge of um, and the safety of my family? What did it mean that this was our neighborhood, uh, that she was not comfortable, even though, right, what's the difference between vintage and junk? Yes. For her there was a big difference, yeah. yeah. Um, what kind of mindset shifts did you have while healing from intense past trauma? Where to begin? <laughs> <laughs> well, the the word I'm I'm going to throw this to you, but you know, forgiveness is is at, in my book, and I mean in yours, and um, but real in yours too. Um, you seem to get to that, you know. You know, it's. I was just thinking about last two weeks ago. I was in Seattle, which is the area where my dad lives, and I was doing book tour stuff. And so he was my running buddy. He actually, actually, he was in the car with me driving to all these places. And you know, we have the kind of relationship now where we say things to each other. And at one point, we were having dinner, and I said, "Well, but, but you." He said something, and I said, "But you, you didn't look for me. You never looked for me. I was always looking for you." And then he said, "Oh." And we kind of moved on to the next thing. <laughs> and you know, it's still there. I think the, a, a, a scar is always there. But 
it's nobody is scratching at it, so it's not bleeding. It's just there, and that's my sort of take on it: is that we've we've scratched at it and scratched at it, and we've and it's healed, and now it's just something that's there, um, at least with my father. And so uh, that's the beauty of, of of forgiveness: that we could just keep having dinner and move on in the conversation, and it wasn't something that I was going to dwell on. It wasn't something that stopped me in any way, right, or him. Um, I think that's the power of forgiveness, yeah. Okay, so I'm hoping that this is a um, safe space for asking about um, journal keeping. <laughs> All right. Um, and I noticed, Martha, that you did not respond to that question, so I'm really curious if you keep journals, but that's really not the question. Um, the question is about sort of the, you know, and I know that the journal keeping and um, uh, writing a memoir are not the same thing, but there are some similarities. And I think there's, you know, a myth of, a, um, of, of journaling, which includes a kind of pouring out, right? Language is just pouring out of you and the complexity that's inside of you somehow transparently flows into language and fills pages upon pages, right? Mm -hmm. my, my own experience of journaling is that this isn't at all the case, um, at, least, um, at least for me, and that actually some of the most interesting moments are, are the ones where the inner complexity um, is resistant to language. And so I'm wondering um, if you had any discoveries about which moments in your memoirs did not want to get written She was asking you because you didn't talk about journals. Well, I wanted to say, <laughs> okay. Um, I, well, the, th the thing that like, comes to mind are, well, two things. One is that journals were incredibly important to me in the writing of An Elegant Woman. Looking back at the journals of um, you know, pioneer women in the West and just their daily things about recipes or what they were contending with on their farms. And I love that. And I, I keep journals and have kept them since I was eight when my mother said, write it down, write it all down. Um, you come from an interesting family, write it down. I've been doing that ever since. And all of my novels have something to do with my family in one way or another. And now I've written this journal, uh, this memoir. Um, in, what, in that question, the thing, there was nothing that I hid. That was the surprising thing for me is that I got to this thing that I've been trying to write about sideways and uh, through the um, scrim of fiction and you know the disguise. Uh, but I wrote it, and it, I hadn't been expecting to, and it's about my stepfather. And um, I was shocked when it came out. So um, I, um, it, it was, yeah, I mean, I, I, so it was, it was the opposite, really. It wasn't even in your journals. Well, it was in my journals because I, I did go back there and I keep I put some of the journal entries in in there. But I but what yes, you're yeah, right. You because I, I even in my journal I didn't say what had happened. Mm -hmm. I even in my most private conversation with myself I couldn't say what happened. Mm -hmm. And so it was really the first time I, I said it. Fascinating. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> like did you keep when you were little, did you have locks on your journals? I've had every kind of journal. Okay. Yeah. I, w I would say that's such a good question. Um, and I was thinking about it, but it actually turns out to be the silences, right? I, I have this pile of, I mean, a whole bookcase of journals at home. Um, but when I was writing this book, the hardest parts that were the scariest to write, the hardest to write, that I would go back to my journals to find, I wasn't writing. Because in when you're writing a journal, it's just you on the page, and you can't really lie to yourself. <laughs> um, and so I just wouldn't write. And there were um, months, uh, I was writing professionally, but not for myself. And there were months, um, probably even a full year, where I just couldn't write. And um, I could piece together the what I needed 
around that, um, but I couldn't get it from my journals because I was frozen. And that's actually really important for me. That was an important um, note, to, to something to notice, because there are days that I come to the page and I can't write, and I have to figure out, all right, what's, what's off? What am I not being um, truthful with about myself that I can't get on the page? It's t I want to say one last thing about that, because I didn't write about other people's stories. That I definitely didn't do. And that's where I drew a line. It wasn't, if it wasn't mine to tell, I didn't do it. And there were, you know, if there were many that I would have loved to have told, but I can't. Um, but it is the end of the class period, and there's a reception over in Hofstra Hall, and um, I would love to see all of you there. It's in the parlor room, right? And buy the books in the back. Oh, yes, and buy, thank you. Buy the books. Oh, raffle, raffle. There's also...